For you, there must be some sense of closure, I hope, in the last week, 10 days, where you finally begin to percolate through all the information of everything that's happened to you. Um, yeah, it's, it's, to be honest with you, it still, it still seems uh, slightly strange. I think the fact that it's been ongoing for such a long time, and obviously considering the magnitude and significance of it, I'm still kind of processing it. If it truth be told, I, I haven't really given it much thought. It's a, it's a positive outcome and a positive outcome for everybody that kind of contributed to the investigation. But um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a period in time that it's, it's, it's hard to kind of make sense of, really. Can you bring us back to the very first time that you remember meeting Kevin MacDonald? God, to be honest with you, you think back over time and different things like that. I think, I think the point and the sort of context for me in the whole thing was, I know you had David Conn on after he ran the three stories, and, and David's exceptional and was incredible in kind of this process but I think what brought me back to it if you like even with regards to thinking about my time there was as much the article and the story he had ran about the young player who had been there and had made a complaint against the club and gone through that process found it incredibly challenging at every hurdle and then went to the Premier League who conducted an independent investigation and had found bullying to have gone on at the club but yes the consequence if you like of that finding was fundamentally that Kevin McDonald was elevated to a different position within the club so my, my circumstance situation was more geared towards looking at what they had gone through and the fact that there was kind of no real closure or positive outcome for them and that's kind of what got this moving again I, I haven't really given it a lot of thought there's been a lot of people have spoken about different aspects of it, bullying, uh, old school, what it was like, people, styles, all that type of stuff. And that, I don't really have a lot of time for that because all of these instances that are going on at the moment, you read about bullying, historical sexual abuse, a lot of the particular elements are case specific to people and the facts are kind of specific. So whilst I would never look to be uh, dismissive of anybody's opinions, I think unless you've kind of lived this to a degree or, or been very, very close to it, it's difficult to be able to talk in great detail about the particular elements involved in this case. Okay, well, I mean, that's a very specific point that you bring up, and you're dead right to bring that up. Everybody has their own experience of, of actually living what this was like. But for you, it, it's really interesting that, that there was a spur to action when a young player at Villa brought a case, the Premier League found that bullying had happened, but Villa's response at that point and football's response was, OK, well, that's, you know, that's in the past now. You can still continue to work in the game and the consequences are not really that severe. Um, that was the thing that inspired you to say, hang on a second now, I am going to revisit the, the trauma of my own case and I am going to make public the trauma of my own case to make sure that we, we start having a conversation properly about these issues and say that's not acceptable. Yeah, yeah, very much so. But I think there's a... A lot of things have to align for that story to become newsworthy or for people to shine a particular light on it. Like I say, when David and I sat down first, it was with a view to him speaking to other people. I, I was kind of reluctant to step forward because my life's moved on. As I say, I have, I have a completely different profession and a completely different life now. But what I found difficult was that when those people started to relive it themselves, it's still um, tender and it was still difficult for people. And, and I didn't kind of have those same emotions around it. It, it was, it's, it's emotional to the degree that you're talking about yourself directly, but with regards to what happened and how it was, I was fortunate because I, I, I still had what people would deem a successful career. How did, you, uh, how did you actually then manage that? Because I think that's one of the very important aspects of all this is that you feel comfortable revisiting very dark period of your life and comfortable talking about it in a way that's very matter of fact. I, 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 like, I guess that's a, a, a testament to your own mental strength and your own ability to get through what you went through. Yeah, but the, the, there's two sides to that, isn't it? The Gareth Farrelly sat in front of you now having a conversation is very difficult and very different to the Gareth Farrelly who was a young professional footballer trying to make his way in break into a first team and have a career that's that's part of life there's probably a level of acceptance and maturity around that now i think 
what became more apparent to me is that even within the context of the first story, I knew how difficult it would be because when the first story was published, if you like, you'll always have a degree of people turning around and going, oh, well, here's an ex-footballer talking about a time, bygone time 20 years ago because he's not happy with how his career panned out. And I understand how people would um, view these things. What was really interesting about this whole process was the fact that, and it was, there was a lot of thought and a lot of detail that gone into it, is that there was a second story which came out soon afterwards, which was basically other people uh, relaying their experience there. And then you had a third article which basically dealt with the investigation that had gone on and which was more recent, if you like, compared to historical. So there was a lot of thought to it. It, it, it was difficult, but there was a huge amount of support for it. And obviously I was aware of a lot of people who had had a similar experience and then took the opportunity to speak to the barrister who conducted the independent investigation. And it's to the club's credit and Christian Porzlo's credit that that's the position they took. Now, as I say, it took a period of time, but we had an outcome and people would deem it to be a positive outcome or a vindication to some degree over the last few weeks. Yeah, no doubt. So just to, to bring everybody else up today to, who might not know some of the details that we're talking about, your new career, you're, you're actually a solicitor, a fully qualified solicitor now, I think working in Liverpool, if I'm not correct, um, and the, to, to fill in the details of the case, um, as, as soon as your story came out, um, I understand David Kahn contacted Villa and contacted the Premier League, and their response was to set up an independent inquiry and I think probably Christian yeah, it was the club. Just, just to qualify it, it was the club that took that position. It was the like club. The Premier League. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So they probably do deserve a fair bit of credit because, you know, uh, when stuff like this happens, um, a lot of institutional response will be, well, look, it's a long time ago. What Really, what's it got to do with it? But actually, it wasn't. It was, it was um, one of their current employees who they immediately changed his role to be non-player facing while the investigation was ongoing. And as soon as the investigation findings were made, now we haven't seen them obviously, uh, they sacked Kevin MacDonald straight away. Uh, I guess that's the, the one aspect of all this that's a little bit, um, uh, you know, it's not, it's, it's not really the public's, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm in two minds and I'd be interested in your take. Is it in the public interest for these findings to be published? The fact that he was summarily dismissed straight away. Well, they haven't said that, Jaren. and again, sorry to qualify that now and, and, and I'm not trying to talk across you, but... He, he he hasn't been sacked, and right. that was not the wording. So again, this is the, the the world we live in. It's fascinating now because we talk about the power of words every day, and we also talk about football and sport and that insatiable appetite for news. Is that all of these stories kind of have a limited shelf life, if you like, in the press? And the point being that the conditions that they'd set out at the start, within the terms of reference, were that the investig uh, the barrister was going to conduct the investigation and then the findings would be presented to the Aston Villa board. Within the press release issued from the club, it was that Kevin MacDonald had left the club. There was no, nothing said about sackings or dismissals or different things because the club would have had its own process to go through with regards to its employment law. The next part of that was that they would be making the findings or presenting the findings to the Premier League and the FA would, to do with it what they would. And that's that's kind of the position with regards to that. Okay, so did they did they interview you as part of this process? Yeah, we. Uh, the, one of the positive things about the investigation, and I did speak to the barrister, was that they wanted people to engage with it, but there was different steps taken along the journey to give and publish and try and publish the fact that the investigation was ongoing, with the hope that this would give people who may not have been aware of it enough forward and speak to the barrister. Now, now again, I go back to this, everybody talks about it. There's, I'm aware of a number of people who came forward and spoke to the barrister and I'm hugely respectful and I've got massive respect for them for doing that because it's not an easy thing to do, especially given the lapse of time. I think we, the reason I mentioned the media and a spotlight around football and that people don't really want to hear about bad news is the fact that those people may have had a different footballing outcome if they'd gone into a club that didn't have people like that there. Yeah, like that's that's the the main part about this is that so many careers weren't fulfilled in the way that they could have been. 
because yeah. of a culture that was allowed to exist. Yeah. Now, there's two parts to that, Jay. Sorry, and it's a really good point you make, is the point that it's, it's hard enough to make a career anyway. And people will hit you with the statistics about how difficult it can be to become a professional footballer. Playing a few games in the first team is not a career. Then all of the additional elements that go with that. But then you have the next part, which you've hit on correctly, which talks about the culture and that whether you're trying to navigate as a young person, whether you're going to have that career or not, one of the things you shouldn't really have to be considering is the quality of the people or whether they're equipped to actually aid a development. And, and that comes on to the other conversation then that people have about, oh, well, it was like it was old school. You had to break people down to build them back up again. And this was just part of the game. On the facts of this particular investigation, that, that was never, never the case. Can you tell us a bit about that? Which, which part? What it was actually like. No, 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 difficult. Like you say, for me, Irish kid away, you're, you want to become a footballer. Your sole focus every day is on trying to get better and try and break into the first team and try and fulfil all of the kind of the ambition you have. And then you, you encounter, like Aston Villa, to trying to create the picture for you slightly differently is that in moving away... I signed for Aston Villa purely on the premise that the youth development officer at that time, Dave Richardson, who's, who I still speak to now, that was the reason I signed for Aston Villa. You, you buy into people. He was, he, was, he was incredible. My family trusted him. And he was the reason I went to Aston Villa. The difficulty I had, which happens in a lot of football clubs, is that you get a change of personnel quite quickly. He was, he was headhunted at that time to go in and set up and run the youth structure within the Premier League. So, youth team coach at that time leaves, next coach leaves, manager gets sacked, new manager comes in and he brings his people with him. Unfortunately for, I, w I would say, unfortunately for those players at that time, the people that came in then were, were Kevin McDonald and somebody else. And like there was another person involved who wasn't involved in the investigation, but I would say was equally as destructive as Kevin McDonald ever was. But because he had left the club, he wasn't a part of the investigation. What age were you when um, Dave Richardson left? 17. Right. He, he left. I signed for Aston Villa and he'd left within three to four months of me being there. And sorry, where, you're a dub, are you? I am. Whereabouts? Northside from the Navan Road. All right, okay. So, yeah. and, and Home Farm was your club? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Home Farm. And I had an incredible time at Home Farm then because of the people that were there. I think my case specifics are different because, again, I was a home board it was a big decision for me to leave. My family, there was huge consideration given to education, the right environment for me to try and develop because I was so focused on home. It was a huge, huge step for me. And Dave Richardson at that time was the person that was able to kind of pacify and assuage my family to say that this is an environment where it's going to be the best environment for him to develop and thrive. And at that stage, Villa are uh, constantly competing at the top of the old First Division and the start of the Premier League. You know, it's like a, a very glamorous. They have a decent enough track record at that stage of bringing young players through. So you're going over dreams in your back pocket thinking, you know, it's a strong Irish crew at the club even at that stage. I have a chance of making it here. Yeah, the strong Irish crew was massive at that time. I think, again, for me... You say dreams in your back pocket. It's, it's, it's no different to the dreams everybody has. I think my first trip over when I was introduced and when I was being brought over to see whether I would sign at the club or not was I was brought to meet Paul McGrath. He was like my, my hero and became a friend. The Irish contingent there were a help. But again, they're getting on with their own careers. I think there's it's that you, you buy into these terrific networks and it's all solidarity and everybody's going in the same direction. Right? It's quite a individualistic element to the sport as well where people seem to look after themselves first, which is only totally natural. I think the other thing possibly that happens in this instance is that no one really understands exactly what the impact a situation is having on the individual apart from the individual and at 17 maybe you're not prepared or equipped or emotionally intelligent enough at that point to realise that A, this is wrong and B, you need to deal with it and then beyond that how the hell do you deal with it? Um, the emotional intelligence point is a really, really interesting one you make. You do, you do know it's wrong, but you have a difficulty because where do you go with it? 
and I think that that's one of the challenges at that time because it, and and that is still um, an enduring challenge for a lot of people even to to this day. How do I deal with this? It's not something that I thought I was going to have to give any consideration to. It created an additional problem for me with regards to going home and family and support structures because all they see is what they see on the TV on a Saturday. So you're they're looking and going, well, how come you're not in the first team yet? Or how come you're not uh, progressing as quickly as some others? And you're trying to say to them, well, I've, I've got a difficult relationship with a coach and I don't feel I'm getting X, Y, and Z. But for them, there was always... Not, 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 not like an institutional element where they would always go. Well, no, hang on a second here. He's the coach. It must be you. So what are you not doing? So again, it creates different challenges that way. Like we're talking about it, and it's, 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 it's by no means an easy subject. It's incredibly complex, and it's there's so many elements linked to that. And that goes back to the point I said about it's so difficult to succeed, even by su- succeeding. What that definition is in, is in its own right. Because succeeding becomes enduring, surviving, being able to continue. I, I, I'm extremely fortunate. Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky. Whereas I know people that weren't able to deal with it, or found it even harder, and then weren't able to move on from it. And 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 there aren't really any winners here per se. There's a conclusion, and it's a positive conclusion that he's not there. But those people will never get that time back again. Gareth, can you, maybe people are wondering like what it was like day to day. We've kind of put the architecture of the story in place for them. But um, when you're 17, 18, 19 and you're in work every day, what is the culture, the toxic culture of bullying actually like for you to live through? How does it manifest itself? The manifestation is just li- little things, aggression. Um, people always having snidey comments. Like I, I kind of set out my own particular experiences in the articles I did with David about things that would have been said at different times. Things weren't good enough. It was never going to be good enough. Reports that were going back to the manager were always focused on what you weren't doing, not the positives that may have happened. In my own instance, like one of the greatest kind of honours you ever had was playing for Ireland, and that would have been undermined, people talking badly about us. So it was just, for, in, in my case, it was consistent. It was consistent, and it would have been there every day. So as opposed to focusing your energy on trying to get better and um, fulfilling your potential and your talent, you were going in on a daily basis thinking, right, well, hang on, what am I going to have to deal with today? And in that, in that article with David Kahn, you, you talked about um, just being wired, constantly at peak physical fitness and yet constantly tired, finding yourself on the stairs at 3 o'clock in the morning, your hands on your knees just staring into space. Yeah, 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 and 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 that and that's and that's a true recollection of how it was then. But it comes back to the point you made again around that emotional intelligence: is that when you're a young guy, you're not equipped, and you don't have that emotional intelligence, and you're not you're going through a process of maturing. You're dealing with all the challenges that of ego around being within that environment anyway, and competing against other people who all want that same thing you do, and not really understanding that. And and that that was as much that point is that. You're going through these emotions where you're, you've got voices in your head and that voice is constant and it's uh, relentless, but you don't really understand it. And then you're countering that by going into training and thinking, well, hang on, I am in supposedly peak physical fitness. I'm doing all of the things I'm supposed to do, but I'm constantly exhausted and this doesn't make any sense and I don't understand it. So it's having to kind of process all of those things and go through it. So... Again, it, it, it's not easy, and I, that's a constant journey. And as I say, I only started to understand that and understand my mind and make peace with it after I became ill. So it took me a long time. That's one of the things that I see quite a lot, how difficult it can be because there's so many things going on that are actually irrelevant to the game itself. Yeah, it's, I mean, you, you mentioned falling ill there, and we haven't even touched on, on that part of the conversation, but um, to... to to just finish up the the time at Villa, did you feel like you were being isolated for any particular reason, or did you see that this was a pattern of behaviour? Not that either one is better than the other, but did you have an understanding that this was how multiple people were being treated, that there was <coughs> certain favouritism being shown, or did you just feel like, okay, well, this is the the culture and the environment that I need to endure? No, no, no. I, I never thought about it, having to endure it because I think what happens then is in your mind it becomes, it's like a confrontation where you think 
the difficulty is and where you're expending more of your energy is you're going in on that daily basis and you're thinking, well, right, I have to put my game face on here. I can't let these people see that they're getting to me. And that takes more of your energy. I think it's probably a combination of all of the points. But it's just how it was. It doesn't make it right. As I say, I don't really give it a lot of thought now. I'm extremely fortunate with how my life has moved on. But I think within the crazy world of football that we all love, sometimes you have to turn around and put your hand up and say, well, no, hang on, that wasn't right. Do you think it's still going on at clubs today? Yes, of course. It does at different levels. And I think there's a, there's a debate to be had now. As we await the Sheldon report, when we look at the historical sexual abuse, when we look at different bullying things that are going on, but I, I, I think it has to be thought out and thought out carefully. I don't think it's easy. We've had the Chelsea report recently. There's lots of interesting things going on. But again, I'm conscious that I wouldn't even say I come on to the scale with regards to the bravery that the guys that have come forward who suffered the historical sexual abuse. I think they're incredible. And I think it sparked a different debate. But I think at some point we have to look to join all the dots up and look to make a meaningful change. Because within this entertainment industry that's um, exploding and continuing to plough on, regardless, you have to give some thought to the people who are involved in it. I think you're dead right about the joining the dots. Like, um, and I'm sure, I'm sure people who suffered bullying must feel like sometimes they can't tell a story when there's another story going on that is as horrific as the uh, historic sexual abuse stories. But actually, if you think about the the culture that allows one to exist, then similar cultures need to exist for secrecy uh, to to be. Um, a currency within a sport the way it had to be for the uh, sex abuse scandals to happen. So I think unless all of society starts talking about allowing people to be open about what's going on with their mental health and uh, with personal relationships, then we're not really going to progress as, as, a, as a race, are we? No, no, no. And, and, and that's not said like a mission statement. Again, it's not sitting, sitting back with this profound opinion that this is how it should be. But I do think it's important because I think with with how quickly football moves, there's a danger that you have a story that in its own right is compelling and fascinating and should be delved into more as a lesson or to develop a better understanding of how that whole thing was allowed to develop and the impact and the effect it had on people. There's a natural sort of urge that, well, we're on to the next thing. Don't worry, the games are back on on Saturday. Yeah. And and, and it sort of moves along. It's like the, the show's no longer in town. And I think that's that's where the challenge lies now because there's a lot of people doing excellent work, but sometimes it still gets lost and people don't know where to go with it or how best to highlight the points you've made about dealing with it properly. Otherwise, it's just all talk. And that's that's the danger sometimes is that everybody will stand up and go, oh, yeah, well, it's really, really bad, but listen, we've got to move on to the next thing then. Yeah, well, and and you are now part of a story that wasn't just all talk. You went public with something that wasn't very easy to go public with, and uh, it has had a, a very positive outcome. And I think that you would hope that that has an impact on other clubs around the Premier League. Have gone well. You know what? Actually, if Villa have had to do this, then we need to audit our own staff and make sure that this isn't how we're treating the young players today. Because ultimately, it's a stupid, self-defeating way for a football club to allow the treatment of its potential superstars in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And and there is people will speak about duty of care and people speak about obligations, but there is an obligation because how that system has evolved even since I was involved in it is that there's kids in academies from eight now. And in some ways there's a there's a lacuna there because the PFA don't tend to get involved until those players either sign on as scholars or become young professionals. So there's a gap between that period where people are heavily invested in the club, heavily invested in individuals. It's like a God complex because they're aware of the power those individuals possess as to whether somebody's going to get an opportunity or not. And I'm not sure in all cases that the people in those roles are equipped to be there. Gareth, if you were to meet Kevin McDonald now, would you speak to him? Would you have something to say to him? No, no. And I'm, I'm sure he'd probably see it be the same as me. I'm, I don't really need to see Kevin McDonald. I've, I made peace with it a long time ago, so... I don't harbour any ill will towards him, so life moves on. And um, when he got the the gig with Ireland, um, do you, 
what did you think at that stage? No, well, that was an issue for me because the point being is that football is becoming more and more detached from reality. So invariably, if you find yourself in a situation where somebody who was quite open and willing to say that your caps, your football, your country was Mickey Mouse, and then all of a sudden he's quite happy to take up a role as the assistant manager for that country. Yeah, it was. you end up trying to reconcile how football can be one of the only industries where something like that could happen. Were you tempted at that point to go public or to say something? or? Yeah, but the, the point I said, which is really, really valid, and like David Kahn's work is around investigative journalism and, and journalism and seeking to expose things that are going on, you're back to the timing element. He would have been in the ascent at that time, new management team, part of it. People don't really want to hear the story. There has to be a number of things aligned for that to become newsworthy. And at that particular time, it wouldn't have been. So yeah. it's, it took time for it to happen, but that's that's invariably how, how the world works now. Yeah, well, look, I'm, I'm really glad you did come forward uh, with that story. I'm glad you've been great with your time this morning. I did want to ask you, you've, um, you, you qualified as a solicitor. You're going to end up working with the Court of Arbitration for Sport a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been recently appointed as an arbitrator, which is um, a huge honour. And again, you talk about silly things, but having had the Cork City case, I was telling somebody over the weekend, having had the Cork City case, the three club rule in 2007, that went all the way to the Court of Arbitration for Sport. When you're a footballer, you've got certain role models. I was extremely fortunate. I got to play with some of my heroes. I had a terrific football career, but in that second career, there's even goals you strive for and... Being an arbitrator at the Court of Arbitration for Sport after the Cork City case would have been one of them. So it's been terrific to be appointed. Now it's um, looking to get involved and get involved in some of the cases. So hopefully that will happen in the not too distant future. Were you sitting there that day in the middle of a con? I wouldn't mind doing this. No, like the law, it fascinated me because all of these people were talking about me, but I didn't really understand the law or the regulations or how it worked. And, that, and, that, and that's kind of where part of my appetite to learn the law came from. So I always kind of went back to that and going to Lausanne and the court itself and seeing the process and experiencing the case and how it all played out was definitely one of the factors in trying to retrain and do something new. Is there a role for you in football at some point, do you think? Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, definitely, definitely. F- football never, when you've done something for the majority of your life, it never leaves you. But I think what I've tried to learn with being a lawyer is to learn to think differently. And I think that's that's what's fascinated me with that. I think learning something new has been incredible, but I think now I would be far more objective and systematic in considering that role, and it would have to be something that is stimulating of interest and uh, worthwhile. I know you said you weren't somebody there sitting there with like a mission statement or a manifesto, but like you could definitely perform a function for the Premier League or for the FA or for, for the FAI at some point down the line as um, somebody who has had experience of what it can look like when it goes horrifically wrong at underage level in, in football and then go into clubs and say, well, you know, maybe you want to check this, this and this. Listen, people, there's some brilliant people doing that already. I think I'm fortunate. I have a role within the FA, which, which I love. I'm an independent football panel member. I have a role within the Premier League where I'm a match delegate, which involves assisting and assessing the referees but like everything I'm, I'm making my way you, you, I'm learning all the time so hopefully opportunity will continue to present itself but I have to keep developing as well That's a, an excellent point to end this on Gareth you've been great with your time congratulations on uh, on the appointment as uh, an arbitrator at the Court of Arbitration for Sport and uh, thanks very much for sharing your story with us this morning No, great to speak to you thanks for your support